the next section uh, of this uh, session is on middleware and services, and the first presentation is by Anand uh, on, on the GIS, uh, GI solid middleware. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Anand Padmanabhan. I'm a senior research scientist at NCSA and the Cyber GIS Center for Advanced Digital and Spatial Studies, and I'm also the project manager for this NSF uh, Cyber GIS project. So we have uh, seen two pieces, the gateway piece as well as the uh, toolkit piece. So now we are going to talk about something which bridges between these two things. So that's our middleware. So GISOL middleware, it has been in development for a while, uh, but it basically serves as a bridge from the gateway, which is for a broad audience for everyone, to the middleware, which is for specialized audience like Yen, who can do really high-end parallel computing, use 131,000 cores, which is not really everyone. So this middleware is there to bridge this gap. Uh, and the middleware right now we have is we have what's called the open service, GISOL open service API. This is the REST kind of an endpoint, which allows you um, to access the high-end computing environment, high performance from the supercomputer centers, high throughput environment, uh, as well as some cloud resources. So the cloud resources are, are the ones we just recently added, and I'm going to focus a little bit more in my talk on the cloud resources and what we did. Okay, so, so the motivation so, uh, for, for using cloud resources is to have a consistent response time, especially for gateway users. Uh, sometimes you have a, a large number of users and you have a high peak demand, for example, during online education. Um, and then when there are hundreds of users using, uh, invariably some of the users will see a slow response. So we, we want to get over it. And then we want to be able to handle problems of different sizes. A um, Couple of challenges we encountered doing this was um, the integrating uh, the existing middleware we had we developed it mainly for HPC, high throughput computing, but then cloud represents a, a different model. So what are the changes we had to make? So th that we had to tackle. Uh, and specifically, um, in terms of workload balancing. So we can allocate more resources, but it's no use if we don't use them properly. Like if you are spending 41% of the time waiting for something, then it's not using it properly. So uh, kind of balancing the workload. And basically uh, trying to make, uh, to have a system where it can scalably uh, give you a good quality of service in terms of if you have a large number of users, you scale up the number of resources available to you, but when there is a low number of users, you can tear down the resources and uh, you are not wasting them. So what we initially had in terms of the integration uh, with a static cluster environment for some of the applications was um, we had the CyberGIS gateway, we talked to a middleware and we had data store where um, you, you were using that for transferring data. Uh, and then you had a static number of VMs, let's say five VMs on which the, the analysis were run. And the GISOL middleware was basically uh, going through it in a round robin fashion and allocating resources um, as they come in from the gateway. So you're um, on a cloud or a, on a static kind of a cloud. So it's um, so, so you had a user submitting the job, data input was through the store, and the results were actually getting downloaded from the VM. So if you go back and look at this, so th these VMs had to be persistent. So if the VM goes away, then the results might not be available to the user. Um, then they logged into the gateway the next time. So, so th those presented some of the challenges. Uh, and also if we had no queuing at that point, so, um, so we had hundreds of uh, requests coming in. Some of the requests might get dropped. So that would be a bad user experience. So s the solution we came up with uh, was to, uh, in collaboration with Kate Kehi and her team at uh, University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab, uh, we used uh, what they call as a Nimbus Phantom uh, system. So they have a decision support engine or decision engine to allocate new resources, it will basically query. So we added a, a queuing load balancer in between, which basically monitors what is the load on the system. So if there is a lot of loads on the system, the phantom decision engine will say, okay, we have a lot of people waiting. We don't want to be, them to be waiting forever. Let me start up cloud resources so that they can handle. And th when it sees that they, uh, there are not many people using it, it will tear down these resources. So we made changes in our middleware to, to talk to this kind of a queuing load balancer. 
Um, some implementation details, we used the uh, HA proxy, which is uh, um, f as a load balancer, and then we uh, developed some custom decision engine uh, uh, um, or decision policies for the engine. Uh, we also had some, something called lazy termination so that we avoid crashing. In that case, let's say if you have 10 users waiting, okay, I, I start up 10, and now you have, say, five waiting, which I just had on five, and then there is immediately five coming up. So, so that is kind of a crashing. This is similar to um, in the original uh, way where you came up with uh, memory and disk. So if you are writing a lot of time into a disk and not using the memory efficiently, similar. Uh, similar thing in terms of not using the resources available efficiently. Okay, so so we did some experiments as well. Um, in terms of the experiments we conducted on uh, future grid resources, we created uh, a HA proxy a store which is uh, which acts as our queuing uh, mediator, and then we had a, a data store as well as the analysis server. And then we did a initial kind of a comparison, initial like a static cluster with five. Uh, static VMs, and then the new uh, strategy, we had the static cluster, but then you had a dynamic uh, thing which could be adjusted based on the load. So two scenarios we studied, basically uh, a small number of users, let's say uh, around uh, 16 users, but they were dealing with large, a little bit large data files. Um, and that would kind of correspond to scientists conducting some studies. And then the second scenario is more of a large number of users in an online environment or a class, classroom environment. Uh, we tested it using Apache GMeter. So this is some of the details uh, of our first um, scenario. So again, like four to 16 users and then only one request per VM. So this was what we saw uh, in terms of the response time. So when we had just uh, four, uh, users, so the response time for the static and the new thing was uh, almost same because well we had like five resources available, so it's pretty much used uh, efficiently. You started using eight, uh, you had eight concurrent users. Now you start seeing the differences between what is available in the uh, the response time in the static versus the dynamic. But when you go to the extreme case where you have the 16 users, in this case, uh, you see the uh, response time is almost a uh, half. So this is what, uh, some more details in terms of how auto scaling. This graph might look a little bit complicated, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, it shows kind of three things. Um, so the first one is showing the number of users. The red one is showing the number of connections coming in. So you have a lot of users sending the job. So you have 16 users um, starting at the same time. You have five resources. So now the system slowly recognizes it, it has some lag, but then so that it can avoid thrashing. Uh, as soon as it recognizes, oh, I have a lot of people waiting, it starts spinning up resources. So and then the policy allows it to go till 15. So immediately it goes till um, in a reasonable amount of time. It has 15 resources allocated. And then it, it tears down as the analysis are getting completed. Uh, and, the, and the good thing you see in, in terms of the response to the user. So this is what is showing as a response time to a user. Uh, you see in the beginning where you have a lot of users um, coming in. Um, so you have a lot of users coming in in the, in the beginning. Uh, so your response time increases drastically. So if there was no remedial action taken in terms of allocating new resources, the response time would have gotten really worse. But as you see new VMs coming in, the response time strings and you see a more flat kind of a response and a more uniform uh, response to the user and what the user sees is a, um, it's kind of a good behavior in terms of uh, the system. Uh, second scenario, uh, we have a large number of users, 32 to 64 users, uh, kind of five requests per user and in this scenario, since this was small request, we were allowing like eight concurrent requests to go to a VM. Again, this scenario, here you can really see the performance effect because you have a large number of users coming in. Um, so the response time, even for like 32 users, it's around 20 seconds average for, for the static plus dynamic while it's over 60 seconds and uh, for the, just the static case. And, uh, and in the 64 users, it's much higher, I guess. So, so you can see the, how the system uh, responds in order to end, how you can maintain a consistent response time. Uh, you can look at this paper. This has all the details. We have, uh, it was just published in June of this year in Science Cloud Workshop. 
Okay, so that's the concluding dis discussion. So what does this give us? Okay, we did integrate with cloud. So what does it give us? It gives us a way to elastically scale. That means it can um, adjust the demand in terms of what uh, the response is to the user. It is, becomes highly available. So you have one of the instances crashing of the VMs. Okay, it doesn't affect the user. So your uh, results are actually stored in the cloud environment, in the, in the common data store. So uh, the other VMs are immediately uh, brought up and they are able to access the resource. So it's kind of a fail-safe uh, mechanism. Um, and a consistent response, consistent and low response time. That is really important, right? So when, when you are dealing with a gateway, when you are saying that this is an inter interactive environment, if your response time goes down in terms of we have 100 users, well, the user doesn't see it. You, the user saying, yeah, I am using the system. I get a poor response time. That's all he sees. Um, and uh, the one other good thing is, so the, the approach we used and our integration with the Phantom, uh, Nimbus Phantom, allows us um, to use multiple cloud infrastructure, um, Amazon EZ2, uh, OpenStack, or Nimbus Clouds. Um, so it's kind of a based on a common uh, scenario or common APIs. So that's all I have in terms of acknowledgement to our colleagues and to our funding agencies. And thanks, questions. Question for Anan. Yes, Rob. So, so the question was, how long does it take to bring up the VM? Um, for these instances, this took around, I think, uh, 50 to 60 seconds to, to bring up a VM in the uh, No, this, the, all these were done in the future grid environment. Good. Another question. Got another question here. Wendy. Wendy. Right. Um, the solution is actually generic um, to, to any computation. Uh, but we actually applied this, I should have mentioned this, uh, to, to a, a specific geospatial problem. We actually did um, the CG PySAL for the testing um, on the cloud. So we use that as a use case. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. We'll move on to um, another one of the middleware uh, and service solutions, and this is uh, uh, Chunhan Yuan, and he's going to talk about the CyberDS service registry. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, CyberGIS service registry and uh, TauDM open top power of integration. Uh, as a cyber GIS uh, partner, so we mainly we participate in uh, two things. Uh, one for the like uh, cyber GIS service registry and uh, one for the uh, Tau DM or uh, open topography integration. Okay. Um, basically, you know, uh, cyber GIS has, you know, several partners uh, for uh, developing services. So, uh, one of the mission uh, for the cyber GIS is, you know, for the like uh, sustained uh, software integration. So um, in our case, you know, uh, uh, SDSC side, you know, we developed a lot of, you know, uh, WSDL or like OGC, WPS, you know, services for uh, software integration. And also like uh, uh, University of Washington uh, developed uh, BCT, uh, agent, you know, so, uh, REST-based services. Uh, also, like Anand presented, like GIS Solve, Open Service API. You know, also like this is a REST-styled services. So uh, our like uh, services like distributed, you know, anywhere. So the mission is how do we like you know 
uh, put the, like, you know, or like collect this, you know, distributed services into uh, one, like, you know, uh, service registry. So in that case, you know, service registry is like a, a building block, you know, for the, like, uh, metadata integration or, like, you know, main software integration. So I think, you know, um, also, like, uh, the objective is uh, to improve interoperability between systems and or like you know cyber, uh, science gateways. So this is like a general uh, uh, goal for the like uh, why you know we use like a service registry or uh, uh, repository. So also like uh, service registry is a key piece of enhancing and uh, uh, achieving reuse of services in SOAR uh, service-oriented architects. Uh, service registry allows uh, service provide consumers to organize information about services and uh, provide a facility to publish and discover services. So uh, resource content varies uh, depend on your like you know, infrastructure needs. So that means like you know it really depends on your like you know service uh, infrastructures or like your gateways. So in our case, uh, we wanna like uh, store uh, uh, metadata of the you know uh, register uh, developed uh, service instance uh, provided by you know CI cyber GIS partner side. Yeah, as well as we are also towards you know outside third so party you know services you know to register so in our service uh, registry so usually uh, service registry stores uh, application metadata or like you know uh, with and you know xml schemas so or like a document so uh, because of that uh, in our group you know uh, cyber gis you know group uh, has investigated or like uh, researches, you know, many solutions or products. Also, like evaluated uh, some systems. So uh, one representative is, you know, this is for the like uh, service-oriented architecture community. They just uh, developed a very like a broad general purpose, you know, using uh, WSO2 governance registry. So this is uh, very comprehensive, you know, when I look at that. So also like you know, uh, UDDI is uh, originally you know for the like uh, uh, soap web service like uh, uh, building blocks. So, but UDDI is for the like uh, soap and uh, WSL uh, services. Also like uh, we uh, evaluated the uh, uh, membrane SOAR registry, but this is just uh, real very handy you know, uh, just like a simple. Uh, Wizard case. So, also like oh, this is also another uh, invest, uh, example is a, a bio catalog uh, for the life science web service registry. This uh, registry is very well defined. They just like uh, have a very specific uh, documentation for like a, a rest style based, and then uh, wizard services only. The rest of the services, the rest the other services cannot accept. So that means like uh, this, you know, uh, bio catalog or for the like uh, uh, also like you know, workflow engine for the Tabena engine. So also like uh, I uh, we looked at like a GS component and service registry for the like Earth, you know, observations. So this uh, uh, service registry also contained, you know. A lot of you know geo resources such as uh, services and the data uh, things. Okay. Um, after that, uh, we uh, have uh, selected the geo portal servers, so uh, provided by uh, ESLI. Uh, these days, you know, this uh, geo portal server is uh, open source uh, so, uh, software package uh, supported by. Uh, lots of you know GIS communities. So also like a uh, uh, GeoPortal server has like a metadata standard fits uh, cyber GIS environment. So uh, we are like you know uh, targeting to registers like a service 
instance metadata. So uh, ISO standard metadata has you know, ISO 19119 schema for describing uh, tightly and loosely coupled geospatial services. So we are using like you know, uh, uh, registra uh, registration uh, schema. Uh, also like a client or like you know, service consumer, consumers uh, discover and find geospatial services in a standard way uh, via like OGC catalog uh, services for the protocol, for the uh, progr uh, programmatic access. So, okay. Um, this is uh, uh, how uh, our like geoportal, uh, our service registry looks like. Uh, this is a uh, uh, service you know, registration uh, uh, editor provided by uh, a GeoPortal server. So we uh, have uh, customized some field you know, to add apps. So one thing is uh, uh, ISO uh, topic category. Basically, ISO topic category is you know, uh, apply, uh, applied to the like. Uh, Geospatial data only, but this is uh, not service there. But we just like you know uh, identify. You know, we need like uh, our service you know categorize you know based on ISO topic cat uh, categories. So also like uh, we uh, added up uh, more specific you know uh, service operation information in it. So okay. okay. Uh, this is uh, our like you know uh, currently you know registered services you know status. So SCSC has a uh, uh, lot of you know uh, SOAP and WSDL based services there. Okay, ASU also like you know has ASU okay wait uh, web services and then uh, University of Washington has a PCT agent services. UIUC yeah has not you know, registered open service API, but I think uh, uh, we will do that soon. So this one, okay. Oh, this is one of our, okay, after like, you know, uh, uh, retrieving uh, or like uh, finding one of like a service record, this is a, uh, uh, this is a I, uh, ISO, you know, 19, uh, 19 you know, schema information, metadata or service identification, yeah, usually. Also, like it has you know operation, and then this is URL. Uh, first URL is the test example how to use these services. Uh, second one is usually like a service endpoint. Behind the scene, uh, we just added a parameter information in it. So also like uh, we need more like you know uh, service description information. Just uh, you can uh, we just uh, use like a distribute tag you know URL name. Okay. Yeah, as I said, you know, before, so we just like, you know, uh, categorize uh, services as ISO topic category, as well as, you know, service types. Currently, we have like OGC, WFS services, and, you know, WSDL and REST style services there. So, okay. Um, also, like, uh, uh, in the morning, uh, David Taberton, you know, uh, describe the uh, uh, what he, what uh, Tau DM is, and then also like uh, he uh, put uh, like uh, some you know demonstration using like open topography project. So that is uh, our like you know uh, participation you know into the like uh, cyber GIS. So uh, briefly, uh, open topography uh, is uh, NSF you know data facility. So open topography provide you know online you know data access uh, to uh, usually like a LIDAR or like a REST data sets. So uh, TauDM software should, uh, this is uh, for the like a uh, terrain analysis software. So yeah, as uh, Dave, you know, mentioned that this is, uh, uh, TauDM is uh, adapted as a science, you know, drive and community services uh, to connect open topography and cyber GIS project. So yeah. Also, like Tau DM, you know, uh, supported by the ECSS, you know, teams for the optimization and uh, to use like an you know, you know, research computing. Uh, for this, you know, we deployed a software package in the dedicated uh, Axid Gordon, you know, ion or the environment. So as well as also Tau DM, you know, uh, exposed as a web services as well. So. Uh, 
our like uh, OT team, you know, integrated uh, key uh, tau DM function into a uh, standard uh, OT, you know, point cloud uh, processing web services. So, uh, and, uh, so uh, uh, tonight uh, also I have you know a demo section uh, for the like uh, cyber GIS, you know, service registry. So yeah, I can you know uh, show more details, you know, what you know services there, how you know registers your services into you know this system. So. Don? Thanks for your talk. And can you say a little bit more about the metadata standards for dual station services? Is your, is your team the only one working on this, or have you been working with other companies, or how is that coming along? Yeah, this is uh, actually, yeah, OGC, ISO standard, you know, metadata. We uh, currently, uh, GeoPortal server provides, you know, template for ISO. Uh, 19109, but you know, ISO 1009 has like you know some uh, useful like operation you know information there, but uh, easily is not you know uh, contained that information. But this is also like you know standard you know tag you know element is there. So we just like uh, brought up and then uh, modified you know editor to you know put in that you know, metadata information into it. Any other questions? Thank you. Our final um, presentation in this session uh, is on um, SAM, a proven its model for spatial analytical methods. And it'll be Win Win Lee and Serge Ray. Yeah, I might need Steve to set this up again. I don't remember what. Uh, this is a, another project at ASU where we're using PySAL as a test case to explore some issues in cyber infrastructure, and this has to do with provenance for not spatial data processing, but extending it to the case where you're doing a spatial analytical workflow, and we want to build some infrastructure to make that happen. And the approach we're taking here is a rather lightweight one in the sense that we could use things like VizTrails um, but in exploring that, we thought it was too heavy. So the idea here is trying to have a distributed um, provenance um, model for spatial analytical methods. Thanks, Steve. Why do we need this? Well, the, many times throughout today, we've heard the importance of being able to reproduce spatial analytical uh, results. It's a critical um, pillar in scientific research. We want internally to be able to reproduce our results as our own research team. We want others to be able to do that as well. Uh, the cost of doing that, of course, is you need infrastructure to enable that. And right now, we don't have very rich infrastructures in terms of spatial analytical workflows for this. This started right uh, year two of the project. Luke Anselin and myself were thinking about moving parts of PySAL into um, HPC environments and what that would offer in terms of opportunities for advancing spatial econometrics in terms of computational advances, but also in terms of improving the science that's done with uh, spatial econometrics in particular and spatial analysis more generally. So in that, uh, you don't read the whole paragraph, but the idea was that the workbench, the spatial econometric workbench, would, which would enable all these analytics, would also enhance our, ab our ability to reproduce research, not just in terms of what was done to the data, but rather the entire decision process that a researcher undertakes when starting from a research question to producing the final outcome in a journal article. Now, if you look at a journal article, you see the final models that are estimated. You don't see the wealth of paper in the trash that got thrown away, the models that got estimated but didn't make it into the literature. So we have a scientific corpus that's biased towards significant results. Those non-significant results are ignored, and that is a huge cost because they're getting replicated again and again by researchers who are going down ends. So we need to capture that. Where we are with this idea of trying to build the provenance into, in our case, PySAL, um, we started with the weights. 
And today we're going to talk about, we've extended what we learned from the weights to try and uh, look at, say, exploratory spatial data analysis in the case of global and local spatial autocorrelation analysis. So the work on the coming up with metadata structures for spatial weights is out in IGGIS this year. And the idea was to come up with a specification for WMD. I came up with the acronym. Luke thought it was a horrible idea given re recent wars that we've been involved in. Um, but I wasn't so sure this was going to work, so I thought it was appropriate. Um, <laughs> we're going to change it. Uh, and it turns out there's a rich variety of spatial weights. So the structure of the weights, whether they're continuous weights, whether they're for binary notions of neighbors, whether they're for continuous notions of neighbors, what are the criteria for cuts, cutoffs, do you have hybrid weights? And it gets very, very complex to trying to think about a taxonomy, if you will, that we're then going to build the metadata on top of. But one one's involved, so that wasn't a problem. Uh, this is an example of how you could use what we, we've built for the, the case of the weights metadata. And this would be input into a, a regionalization problem. These are traffic analysis zones where you want to form regions. Um, so we have the TAZs. We're connecting the centroids of the TAZs. But for the optimization problem, there's a constraint that the regions can't cross county borders. Right? That's the idea. Here are th the inputs, uh, the contents of three different metadata files. So this is how we would build block weights to form neighbors for all TAZs in a county. This would form weights for rook neighbors, so first order contiguous neighbors. And then this is yet another one that does intersection. So I want to form the intersection, which gets us that map. And this actually takes as input other metadata files. So it's a recursive process. You can rebuild the data structures you need as inputs by chaining these things together. So that's where we were with the weights. Now we want to push it into extending this to um, spatial analytical workflows. And I'll turn it over to Wenwen. Uh, Serge has introduced the prominence of our research, and now I will introduce uh, the ongoing research activities within our team. So we propose to build this three-layer model to capture the prominence towards building the spatial analytical workflow. The topmost layer is um, the abstracted specification layer that we hope that we can develop a community consensus specification to capture the prominence information to benefit the whole GS community. Well, this specification hasn't existed yet, but we hope that the pioneer work that we have been working on in terms of WMD and SAM will provide the uh, building block support to the development of these specifications. And the middle layer is the prominence interpretation layer, which is actually most of our research activities is centered on. We have developed a prominence engine, which has two roles. The first row is that um, it can automatically capture recording and enabling the generation of provenance information during the execution of a scientific workflow. And the second role is once this provenance information is given, for example, if some uh, metadata has already been encoded in the same structure, the provenance engine can parse it and make interpretations of it and automatically execute it in order to reproduce the result. So by the support of this engine, we hope that we can ensure the science uh, replicability. And the bottom layer is the library layer, which has a lot of the software packages to support spatial analysis. For example, PyCell, Giada, and SPREG. We hope that we can build a cross uh, walk between these different software packages such that the result generated from one package can be automatically validated uh, by another package through the definition of the prominence model. Now I will give a demonstration of the two of the prototype and the two systems that we have been developing um, at ASU. So the goal is to ensure the interoperability between the two systems. One is implemented as a web processing service, which is compliant with the OGC standard. And the other one is a REST API. Both of them are built on PyCell, which provide the web interface to uh, enable the remote invocation of the backend functions within PyCell. Um, so the goal is to use the spatial analytical metadata stem generated from one system, S1, within S2, and to reproduce the result in S2 to cross-compare the, um, the accuracy of the result. 
And uh, here is a demo showing the prominence metadata for generating a local statistics using LISA. And the left-hand side, um, you can see this is a SAM structure, which defines the input analysis type parameters and output. And in terms of input, we need the spatial weights, which gives the spatial dependency between different spatial units. And we also have an attribute, which tells us, based on which value, we want to compute the local statistics. As uh, Serge has already demoed, that the trick is we are not providing the actual weights file. Instead, we are telling the system to um, generate or reproduce the waste time on the fly. So that is the work of the prominence engine. And here is uh, just a, a, a quick demo. It's, we, this is a get request and send the execute request to the OGC WPS by providing the prominence information uh, in the link. And this sample response is encoded into the XML-based format. So implementing it as a, a OGC web processing service has the advantage that um, it can be made interoperable with other systems. And the bottom link, link, you can see all the statistical results generated by the local more inside. Uh, for example, it shows which spatial unit has the value which is statistically significant. And uh, here is um, a quick demo, and uh, this demo is implemented by our graduate students, uh, Jay Laura, so I will give the full credit to him. And uh, what we are trying to do is we are going to load the data within Columbus, Ohio. This is a crime data, so darker color shows there are more crime events in the sub-areas. So what we try to do is we invoke the REST API to generate the local statistics. So now the, you can see the result has four uh, different color groups. That means the four uh, spatial patterns that is generated, for example, high values is adjacent to high values, low values is adjacent to low values, and uh, two low-high combination. And uh, what other thing we did is we used the prominence information generated from the system S1, which is a web processing service, and load into this uh, REST API to reproduce it, the data again. So we can see the data exactly the same between the two systems, S1 and S2. As for next steps. Uh, just to wrap up, since we're out of closing out of time here. Um, there's some challenges here. The technical ones are arguably the easier ones. Uh, I think getting community consensus on what the SAM specification should be is a really thorny problem given the heterogeneous, heterogeneous nature of spatial analytical methods. Um, we've got advice from well-known members of the community that said just go and write it yourself uh, because if you go first people will follow. Um, so that's an interesting discussion perhaps that the reception people can talk about. And then more broadly, what actually, how far do you go with this? Um, we, I think geospatial analysis is particularly uh, daunting if you think about when do you stop tracking the provenance and wh where do you start in terms of someone working at their desktop doing spatial kind of metrics, where does their provenance begin and end and how do we deal with those issues? Thanks. Quick question for Serge and Winwin. Yeah, so um, I was wondering are Carl and Gage, you might be in uh, what the Earth Tree people are doing for Providence. Are, uh, are you been, MCSA is interested in this national data service, but they're trying to also uh, uh, tackle the problem of uh, issues of uh, Providence. Are you familiar with their work? Are you looking at it? Are you engaged with them? Um, we are not engaged in the, that so the, audience. the question is uh, whether we are aware of um, a number of the prominence activities within EarthCube, the NSF program, and also um, which NCSA. oh the NCSA. National data service. Oh, um, we um, we are not involved in the EarthCube activities so far, but we are uh, fully aware of the existing provenance models. For example, the W3C models and also the ISO models, the, which is um, designed for the recording the provenance of um, raster data, mostly the remote sensing images. And I think this is uh, one of the earliest work that we focus on uh, capturing the provenance for spatial analysis modules. Um, if there will be some collaborations to branch um, our efforts, I think that will be 
that would be great. Thank you.